Last topic in the Industrial Revolution is labor unions. And this is the one you probably know, I would think, the least amount about. It's not that difficult to understand what a labor union is. A union is a group of common workers who attempt to get better working conditions. Um, the first explanation needed is common workers. There's different unions out there for different jobs. So from the scenario in your situation, you were coal miners, it would make more sense for you to join a coal mining union. Myself, I would join the teachers union. And they organize them within different groups because not all of them have the same conditions. For instance, a coal miners union, they're concerned about having protective equipment and not working weekends. Whereas a teacher, that's not a concern of mine. So they organize them based on the different groups. So there's not just like one big union out there. In order to join a labor union, there are two requirements. First of all, it's not free. You have to pay. Every month you pay money or what they call dues to the union. I'll talk about in just a second what that money goes towards. You also have to have a job in that union. For instance, you guys can't join a teacher's union because you're not a teacher. I can't join the firefighters or the police union. You have to have a job within that specific profession. So how do unions get what they want? Fancy phrase of the day, collective bargaining. Collective means group. Bargain means negotiation. So what happens is the union goes in with the employer. Back to the coal mining scenario. The union would go in and they would sit down with the owner of the coal mine and they would say, okay, our workers want $3 more an hour. They want you to pay 50% of their health insurance. The owner of the coal mine might come back and say, you know what, I can't afford that. I'll pay them a dollar more an hour and I'll pay 35% of their health insurance. And then the union thinks, well, that's not good enough. So there's kind of this back and forth to where they eventually make a deal. Sometimes these negotiations can go on for weeks, if not months. Um, here's where your money goes to. We have the dues. What the union does is they hire experts. Typically, they're lawyers. And those lawyers are the ones that negotiate on behalf of the workers. For instance, when I went to college, I didn't take a class about collective bargaining. I'm not trained to do that. So that's the whole point of paying money you hire lawyers that represent the workers. They're the experts, and they sit down with the owner to get what they want. One option. So let's say the collective bargaining, the negotiations goes nowhere, and neither side gives in. There is the option to strike. A strike, you guys have seen this on the news or maybe in movies, TV shows, etc. A strike is when workers refuse to work until their demands are met. They don't quit their job. If they quit their job, that's a completely different story. What they're saying is we're still workers working for this employer, but we're not going to show up to work until you give us this, this, and this. Here's the deal with strikes, though, a couple of things. First of all, if you go on strike, you're not sitting at home. Okay, obviously you're not at work because you're on strike. What's expected is that you show up to the workplace and you're out front and you're picketing. You probably have seen this in the movies or on, on the news. This is when they're holding signs and they're marching around and chanting different things. So you have to pick it. Also, you have to remember you don't get paid. Okay, if I own the coal mine and you're the coal workers and you guys go on a strike, I'm not paying you. So one question you have to ask is how long can you go without getting paid? And if the answer is only two or three days, and after two or three days you end your strike and you come back to work, I won. Because I know you're going to give in easy. The way I look at a strike, it's a, it's a game of chicken. Okay, Who can go the longest without getting paid? Because the workers aren't getting paid. They're on strike. If I'm the coal mine, mine owner, I'm not getting any money because I don't have any workers to produce coal. So who can go the longest and who gives in first? Another thing you have to think of is, can you be replaced? If you can be replaced easily when you go on strike, the employer could just fire you and replace you. So are you a skilled worker or an unskilled worker? This isn't true today, but back during this time period, there were a couple instances where strikes turned violent. The workers showed up to the workplace. They were out picketing. Um, the owners of the factory sent in... <laughs> 
security to break up the picketers and people ended up dying. This, I can't remember the last time it happened in modern times, but common back then. I mentioned that also before you get any bright ideas. In some states, it's illegal for certain jobs to strike. For instance, teachers in Kansas cannot go on strike. There's a law that is against it. And the reason why is if we go on strike, you're not getting an education. So the state has essentially said it's more important for you to get an education than for me to possibly go on strike to get better working conditions. Another instance, it's from a while ago, but in the 1980s, air traffic controllers went on strike. Those are the folks that are at the airport up in the tower, and they're making sure planes don't run into each other. They attempted to go on strike, and Ronald Reagan, who was the president, he stepped in and he told them, if you go on strike, I'm going to put you in prison. His thinking was, if we don't have air traffic controllers, we don't have flights, business, and the economy go down. So he forced them to continue to work while negotiations continued. Okay, wrapping this up. During this time period in the Gilded Age, this is when we first began to see labor unions kind of come to be. And the reason why, jobs were bad. We've learned this. Workers were working long hours, 60 plus hours a week. They weren't getting paid anything, 10 cents an hour on average. They worked in dangerous conditions. Every year, tens of thousands of people died on the job. So in the late 1800s, workers finally said, you know what, enough is enough. We're going to form these things for called unions, and we're going to attempt to fix some of these problems. With that being said, it took some time. It's not like they came in immediately and fixed all of these issues. But over time, slowly, things change. And I can prove this. For instance, today we have a minimum wage. We have, I think it's $7.25. That's a, the minimum amount someone can get paid. Also, we don't have as long work weeks. Your employer can make you work over 40 hours a week. That's the typical work week. But if you're an hourly position, meaning you get paid by the hour, they have to pay you overtime for everything over, I think it's 44 hours. Also now we have laws in place. Um, there are laws in place that say factories have to meet these.